talk me through the engine world right now. So we're in the middle of this really cool podcast theories, right? Yep. And uh, I'm probably like, I don't know how many that we've canned that are going to be, you know, we're rolling them out in pieces because we found that people don't like, if I roll it out as a whole, mm -hmm. people don't consume it as a whole. So we're rolling it out in pieces. So it's more consumable, but each podcast has a different audience, right? So um, I've had podcasts, you know, with luminaries of industry that are like the celebrities of the space. Yeah. And then I have some that are just like, I had one with Peter Gross on that'll be aired in the next you know few weeks. And that one is going to really be for the, engineers if you're an engineer he's going through fission fusion mm -hmm. and hydrogen on there very really really deeply and 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 you know some are f targeted on a different audience i'm i'm going to have two 25 year olds on this podcast soon and one was a uh, they're both in this industry they're both in marketing one got in through the military and one got in you know, the college route and they're going to talk about how they arrived in this industry and stuff every podcast has a has a different real you know, group of people that are going to tether onto it a little bit more. For us, assume that there's a lot of people that want to know more about our power and what your guys' capabilities and limitations are. Mm. And then what the philosophy was for you to say, hey, look, we want to make engines and there's a lot of different uh, verticals of industry that need it, that are emerging, commercial, industrial, yeah. you know, the chip manufacturers, you know, there's a lot of groups that need power right now yep. and people. Yep. How did you get into this part of the industry? Because you're building you know, you're talking about UPS or uh, engines that are built in block sizes that we haven't engineered a homogenous environment around that's mm -hmm. standardized yep. on throughout the industry. Yep. But I definitely wanted to have you on here mm -hmm. before um, you understood the industry well enough to, to put a limitation of construct around the capabilities and limitations of what a product can do based on the application. Yep. So let her rip. And yeah. like knowing that I just want to, I want everyone to understand what our power is all about by the time we're done, right? And and how players like this are contributing to the way that we're going to grow in this industry because this industry uh, is growing faster than every other industry because of every other industry. And if we can aggregate some of these things, if you look at it, the one commonality that every industrial revolution has had is the development or unleashing of some form of power and 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 this, the number one demand for every industrial revolution is some form of power, yeah. right? So right now, everyone's freaking out for what we're gonna do in the next 10 years, because mm -hmm. they're assuming that in 10 years from now, we'll have some sort of nuclear mm -hmm. option that's more prevalent, you know? Right. Yep. Uh, but until then, natural gas engines are probably gonna be the biggest band-aid that bridges us between these two technologies. Do you agree? I 100% agree. I mean, I bet my whole career on it. <laughs> so, so you and I both, right? Yeah, so yeah. to that end, I don't want to stop you with my stupid questions, but like help us understand, yeah. you know, the bridge here. Yeah, no, for sure. So um, uh, let me think about where to start on this. You know, I, I, I cut my teeth at GE in the natural gas engine, natural gas generator world. I want to make it clear our power is not, you know, developing natural gas engines, natural gas generators. Sure. There's plenty of OEMs out there sure. that do great work. And, and have that technology. Sure. And I could talk a little bit about the differences of it. Um, before I went to R Power, I was at Generac Power Systems. Generac, and, yeah. and I was trying to uh, grow their uh, commercial and industrial, not their home standby stuff, gas generator business globally. Um, but the, the emerging need here in the United States for distributed power assets to not only act as standby power, but also help firm the grid when either the renewables drop off or Rangers. there's a natural disaster or, hey, the, right now the grid just can't get there quick enough, right? Yeah. Uh, emerge. And uh, that's when I linked up with Jeff Starcher. Um, he uh, is the founder of Our Power. Uh, his previous company was MP2 Energy. He sold that to Shell. Uh, he's been in, you know, over three decades in the business, whether it's been trading power, um, uh, rolling um, products to market like demand response or managing power plants in the market. And he had started assembling a crew of uh, folks that had legacy power industry, but on the big side, like on, you know, large, GE stuff, yeah, yeah guard, large gas turbines. And um, with me, I brought a crew that had the distributed business that understood reciprocating gas generators, right? And so we kind of brought the company together. Right now, there's 25 of us. Um, I would call us a, a development shop that's very well funded that brings the power market dynamics, the analytics, along with the engineering design, um, the relationships of all the OEM, OEMs, understanding of technology, and can package that all, one, all in one and bring you a solution. Um, the original hypothesis behind our power was, hey, let's take a bunch of standby generators, 
let's own them, let's sell standby to the end customer, and then let's grid tie them. And then when the grid's right in ERCOT, let's flip them on during the summer and on make some money. Co gen, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but what we what we started what we've been seeing is that there's just a general lack of power, and in two particular spots, oil and gas and data centers. Yeah. A hundred percent data centers more. Yep. I think we're exposing those gaps yep. more Yep, because it's sure. directly tied to the adoption rate of emerging technology. Yep. Technology demand goes higher, mainly because of the surge of usage of AI, the demand of power, you know, to um, generate one question on chat GPT is equivalent to charging your cell phone oh, 60, 60 times. times. I heard that on your right. show. That was so, like crazy. <laughs> yeah. Right. But I keep repeating it because <laughs> we have to remind people yep. like, Man, we're we're drawing and demanding so much power that we're not changing the solution. Yeah. And uh, right now, we better start galvanizing around what the bridge solution looks like. Yeah. And you're working on putting together bridge solutions, yep. right? So, and and you're saying, look, we're going to make this so it's standby for you, yeah. but it'll be emergency for the grid if it needs to move the needle to the left for. Uh, moments of the summertime where people run into many air conditioning units and we're going brownouts or some shit. You're trying to you're trying to mitigate that risk. Yeah, yeah. You know, so legacy data center and hey, correct me if I'm wrong on this stuff, right? Yeah. Because I know the power side. I know what I'm seeing in the data center. You you have a tier two diesel yep. that's backing up the data center, and I mean, there's just megawatts and megawatts. Of I mean, like I look at the cat lead times. I know what their order book looks like. I mean, they got gigawatts of backlog. Hundred percent, right? So you have cat tier four typically, but yeah, yeah, they're moved to tier four. They used to be tier two. Now they're moved to tier four. So you got all these assets there that um, you have to get diesel on site. Um, it's not as clean as natural gas, and the reliability is no better. And now there's technologies that make the transients response of a gas unit just as good as diesel is diesel like and so you you have that legacy market of backup diesel and you have also the fact that those a lot of those diesel units being used it's impractical if the grid's not there to keep them going you know for prime power usage it's impractical yeah impractical right so let's say i'm i'm building a new data center and the grid isn't there yet Right. Okay. You have to that's produce common. on site. Yeah, that's happening now from what I'm and, seeing. And most countries, it's happening all the time. In the United States, we rarely have to fight that. But in some markets where it's so much activity in data centers has taken place, then you're going to fight for that. Yeah, yeah. It's an advantage to schedule. You're going to pay for it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So why wouldn't you build something that's on site with gas if you have access to an interstate pipeline that you can provide your own power? Right. And then when the utility gets there, Use those those units that you were using your prime as your backup instead of rolling in a bunch of other diesels. Like, you know, when you look at the standby world, you go back to let's say 2005, 2010, it was probably 80% diesel, 20% gas. And it's almost 50 50 now when you look at standby generators outside of the outside of the data center. Not market. surprised though. Right. Man. And it's just been you have gas infrastructure, the infrastructure is reliable. If you have a longer duration outage, you look at like events like Superstorm, Sandy, Yuri, right? Folks that had backup ga uh, diesel generators were not getting diesel deliveries, right? The, 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 there was not enough diesel, the roads are down, but the gas is still flowing. Now, Yuri, you heard, you know, big, some big transmission lines went down because of commission, um, um, big transmission lines went down because of compression and some different things there. But for the most part, people with backup generators, they were running. Yeah. So, so, so gas is reliable. This is my point. So, but how much, what is the barrier to market then? Why isn't it more prevalent? Does it not pencil out well? Is it because there's a perceived optical risk that's higher because I'm using I, gas versus yeah. diesel? I think, it's, I, I think it's a perceived optical risk. Gas is more expensive than diesel. But if I can, if I have a bunch of standby gas generators on right now, is it? I thought diesel was more expensive than well, gas. Well, the fuel. Oh, the yeah, gas gen, okay. the, sorry. Gas gen sets are You're typically right, so. more expensive than diesel. Um, but if right right now, if I have a gas generator that's a backup in ERCOT, I'm able to actually utilize that in the market when it's not being utilized for on-site power for for you know loss of utility. And if the utility is lost, it's just providing power. There's no market to provide to, and that helps drive down the cost of the unit. Right. So it, it no would just shift the the load that it's 
covering from this to that through yeah. some, okay, yeah. I got you. Yeah. So it's not uncommon. I mean, honestly, what you're describing is just upstream of the, of the data center a little bit. And what I mean by that is most of these data center owner operators, I mean, think about data centers as being stock cars. Yeah. And uh, what really makes the difference is the driver and the pit crew right and and they answer to the owner and the owner dictates the speed and the risk right so you know these ops teams they're the ones that have the ability to uh, balance out the ups loads throughout pdus right and you know one of these one of these things that's really simple to discover from a function of economics is is i have uh in any distributed um, electrical topology, I'm going to have stranded capacity on a back plane that I'm not selling. Mm -hmm. So I could always open up and hang, you know, more RPPs or something downstream of a PDU, mm -hmm. but I would, and, and I could sell dirty power in power in plus one reliability to it, so to speak. And if it goes down, those people aren't protected on a two and SLA anyway, mm -hmm. and they had a four hour response time or some shit, but that, that would shunt trip open for that client if they needed to protect the load to the primary clients under a two and SLA. So you're talking about a very similar thing where you're right. putting power on a distributed model. And if something fails, you have a replication power exactly. model to support it, right? Yep. yep. Okay. So, and then what do you do when you're going out and you're buying other collections of, of power generation plants? Yeah. So, so, well, for, for, well, let, let's, so, for the the stuff that we're building, we're technology agnostic, right? So we work with the major, you know, OEMs, Caterpillar. Um, for actual providing other power to the grid, right? Once you aggregate enough distributed resources, right, you actually have a portfolio that you can enter into the market if that's what you're asking. Yeah. So help you understand that because that's a solution to industry. Yep. I mean, that's where I wanted to go, yep. right? I'm trying to figure out like we have all these people that are coming in from the industry, coming into the industry from the outside mm -hmm. in with solutions yep. that we from the inside looking out don't know exist. Mm -hmm. And that's why like these podcasts are, are incredibly critical because they allow for a greater exchange of these types of market needs versus market capabilities. Yep. And then aligning these things to where it's more amplified to other people could understand it, right? So there's alternatives out there to an enchanted rock or something mm -hmm. they could, our power could offer them on demand or backup generation as a service. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Is that ultimately yeah. where we're going with yeah. all these so, groups that are coming in? Yeah. So we can, we can uh, build them a backup generation system, right? Really what we're looking at right now is we can build you a utility bridge, right? We'll build you a power plant that provides prime power for you while you're waiting for the utility to come, right? So if you have a development area, you're waiting for the three-year interconnect, we can build you a prime power solution. We have all the relationships with the OEM to get something there on the ground operating in probably 12 months. And, um, the, the the biggest uh, hurdle in that will be the the gas interconnect and you know timing of that depending on where it's at, um, but then once the utility is there, we're fully ready to take that asset now and use that asset in the market. Not only for primarily that asset can provide you a backup if the utility goes out, so you have your redundancy. And then we can utilize that asset in the market to help reduce the cost of your sure. energy. But are you the one to then, like if I was a data center operator, would you be responsible for doing all the modeling? Of, yes. Yep. And, and since those- So we're, the, we're level four qualified schedule and entity in Texas. So that means that we could trade assets in the market, right? Any power, uh, so to, power assets. So break that down to public school kids like yeah, me. Public right? school. That means if there's a generator, right? Either a generator or a load. Right. I could put it in the market and curtail it or manage it to and, optimize your electric bill. Okay. And and your client is ERCOT. Uh ERCOT is the market clearinghouse. Our client is so right now, let me just give you an example. We have a 10 megawatt water treatment facility. Uh-huh. We have our gens there. Yep. Right. That, now they they bought it as a service. So they didn't buy the engines. They're not responsible for getting them sat, landed, cabled, commissioned, and running or fueled. They're not responsible for the that's permits, all, the entitlement, any of the Our things. power did all that. Okay. So that's what the true as a service model yep. looks like. Yep. And and the question is, will we start seeing more of that versus the operators themselves taking on the blunt of having to go set on, I mean, what's CAT at? 65 weeks on engines right now? 
right? Cummins is probably in the upper fifties and sixties as well. Yeah. I mean, even more, Okay, right? Even more. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, someone told me 90 something. I was like, there's no way they're in. No, the- they, we got a quote from, from Kat. Well, we're on a diesel quote. They told me a few weeks ago, it was, it was pushing almost 90 weeks. Yeah. So I, that's, <laughs> they're just super punishing people now, right? Yeah. I mean, like you better, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's two years. Yeah. If, yeah. if you don't know what you're doing exactly in two years from now, we can't help you. Yeah. Isn't <laughs> exactly. that incredible? Yeah. Well, but that's why there's this need for this middle group who's handicapping and hedging that. Cause you know that if you go get these long lead components and items and you uh, put together your own thing, which is your own product, your own service. I don't know how you skid them, transfer them, assemble them, whatever, but you're, uh, you're assuming all of that shit and I don't have to worry about that. I could just go to you and be like, how long until I could have engines as a service here? Right. Pretty much. All right. Yep. And, and, and you right now would say the lead time is what? I would say t- probably 12 to 15 months for, well, actually we're working on something right now that has to be up and going by the end of October. Okay. So I can't talk about 15, <laughs> I got you. But 12 to 15 months and you're saying right now you're functioning heavily or focused on Texas. So yep. it takes 12 to 15 months in the state of Texas. If I wanted to go out in the middle of podunk nickel mm-hmm. and be like, I get, <sighs> mm, I get hydropower. I don't know whatever would drive me out there, yeah. but uh, I could go out there and you could be like, well, look, I can give you all your power mm-hmm. as a service. And then like, listen, let me ask you. Now that we unpackage the functional mechanics and logistics of how the service works, mm. what's the, uh, it really works in markets that are either distressed or lacking capacity of, of any power, right? Because it it has to be what, 2X the cost of, what we have, what is it right now? So, so you know, a general rule of thumb on gas gen sets is $1,000 a KW installed. So mm-hmm. a million bucks a megawatt, okay. right? And, you know, the tier four solution, you're probably eight eight hundred ish a kW, right? So eight hundred thousand megawatt. Okay. So it's a, there's definitely a little bit of a premium, right? And that's just that's just been the rule of thumb forever on on you know installing gas gen sets. But then you pay for the dividends that you get in the long term, or yeah. that you. Yeah. So what's the average percentage of savings you get over the course of same duration of time? Like if I go one versus the other over the course of ten years. Yeah. So so typically what when we provide our service, we say we we are basically installing it for about forty to sixty cents on a dollar of what the customer pays for, to do it themselves. Because we're providing the service, but we're using that asset in the market to drive down the cost of backup service. Yeah, so you're really dependent upon having. We're taking the market risk. Demand. Yeah, we're taking market risk on it, right? Yeah, and we're dependent that these assets are going to grow in value. Now the uh, the provider, the utility provider, yep, they have the uh, ability to operate it. On demand whenever they want? Uh, no. So they have to call you? They have to call us. Well, it, it depends on size, but just assume they have to call us, right? Okay. So they have to call us, but to be very clear, our first service is always the host customer. Okay. Right? So if I'm providing standby and you sign a standby as a service contract with me, you know, standbys first before any other market operations. I got you. Yep. Okay. Yep. Got you. Got you. And and we're on the hook to give you standby. <laughs> so do you see data center operators using you for standby more often versus putting in their own load rather than trucking in and going through the the delay of, I mean, it takes six months to make a business case to justify deploying capital to buy engines, takes a it's year. It's a CapEx to, or an OpEx switch, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you're completely shifting the model and get it in as needed and on demand. And as a service is the entire mo- like. Someone said it a long time ago, they're like, we don't longer live in, we live in an application-based world. Whatever you need, there's an app for that. Mm -hmm. And on the other end of what we're doing, we're going to be, you know, that that demand is the consumer transcends all the way through the technology stack into us to where we will have to solve for it in a very similar fashion as a service. Everything will we do will be almost app-based as a service, Mm -hmm. right? And that's okay. I think that I... I feel very hopeful and optimistic about these. Uh, you know, I think there's some tipping points coming in technology that are going to be more favorable for us. But I think uh, if you think about how you how you get an industry that is evolving faster than every other industry because of every other industry, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and we're getting ready to start because of because of the adoption rate of AI and the surge of popularity with it, we will buy, we will benefit the most. This industry will benefit greater than any other industry because mm-hmm. we milled the engine for AI, right? And that's gonna require more power. And one half of the conference that we'll do DCAC this year will be just focused on power probably, right? Uh, at least, I mean, between 30 and 50% of the topics will just be power. Mm-hmm. So 
how do you get to the point where um, people, these sophisticated operators that are armed to the teeth, because the primary line of business they use is that space power and cooling to generate revenue. And if you're telling me they're taking the engines out and shifting the CapEx to an OpEx, what would be the benefit for them doing that? And what is the risk to them doing that? Yeah. You know, because that's what you yeah, want to be yeah, unpackaging yeah, on. This. Yeah, no, you're, and you face that, right? You face it. You're like, why? You know, why don't I just go hire guys that can do this? Or, um, like, no, why wouldn't I just go buy myself? I always have, yeah. and I'm, I'm responsible for myself. I mean, it, there are some operators out here right now that can go and put their engines on. Yeah, I know an operator in Phoenix that does it, right? So, yeah, because because the world's changing for them is is what I've seen. You know, here over the past you know nine twelve months, the world's changing for for those folks because now they're up against different interconnection requirements. They're up against different emissions requirements. They're up against a time requirement, it seems. Speed the markets, everything, right? So do, am I able to move fast enough or do I, could I use a partner that's reputable, that's been building projects for three decades that you know knows what they're doing? And um, there's, you know, I think there's gonna be, a, there's a shift from the diesel to other technologies, like before you get to like a SMR or whatever, you know, but other technologies and that's gas. And they're like, why aren't we using gas? It's 98% cleaner. There's abundance of it. Um, and I can utilize it for other applications. If I'm, you know, if I do not have the utility yet, right, I can put a gas genset out there and produce fairly reasonable cost of power. So the largest, um, so talk to us. I think I get all that. That's fantastic, actually. I want to get into um, like, what is the, so it's as a service, but the product itself again that you're doing is uh, the service that you offer is still predicated on. Gas a, a, but it's, uh, hey, is there a minimum amount of time I have to sign a contract for? Uh, is there, um, like, how does that whole model work? Help right. people understand, you know? So our tip, our typical resiliency as a service models, you know, we, 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 uh, try to, you By know, sign an order, that sign, means how, sign in around 15, 12, 15 12 years, 15, 12 to 15 months. And then we try to, you know, have a 15 year contract where we're providing that backup as a service. Okay. Right. We have contracts that are shorter. We have contracts that are longer gotcha. current, in our current state. Um, I would say that, you know, one thing about us and our capital provider that supports us, not only is it competitive in rates, but they're super flexible about deal structures. Right? So it's really interesting taking the need of backup power away from the operators and then creating another uh, subdomain within the domain industry of mission critical itself or power specifically within the mission critical itself. And now you're, you're solving for, uh, I think it's an underserved solution right now. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a lot of options out there for it. I know that there's a couple like the one I mentioned, that's probably trying to get in the game, but, um, are you agnostic to any specific engines then? No. Or? So, so, so we, we are, we, we've standardized around a couple products, but we, we call ourselves technology agnostic because we believe you, you have to fit the application with the right technology and not one box is going to, going to, you know, no matter how many of them you put out there is, is going to be the right, you know, for the application, especially, sure. especially when you get in some of this where it's going to be prime power for a bit. Um, because, uh, you know, then you get up against fuel consumption and heat rate and how much fuel you're burning over a two or three year period makes a tremendous difference. You're going to go through several million dollars in fuel, right? Sure. Depending on the size of the power plant. Um, so we have on the low end, we have a 500 kW rich burn unit um, that that we have in uh, several installs um, and, and are working on it in a data center install as well. And then on the high end, we work with uh, Wartzilla. You, you might know them from from your sailing days. Um, they have an eighteen point eight megawatt uh, large gas genset that you know we've had a few operators come to us and say, "Hey, we want to do large power blocks. Yes. We want to we want to get away from this, you know, three point three megawatt bullshit." Yeah. And like, there's no reason you can't. So, um, you know, quick start time and on those, the larger ones aren't going to give it's you the ten start time. It's about how you have all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. So one engine doesn't start. And you got a problem, right? So like, that's why you see a lot of those like Volvo Pentas in parallel or in series, yeah, yeah, right? So yeah. my thing is, is that's a big lift. I think that that would be uh, interesting to see how the world, is that a natural gas engine? You natural said? gas genset, yep, yep. Yeah, so so we got- I wonder how our industry would adopt that. I, I would imagine the enterprise end users or the large hyperscalers are the ones that are probably the most interested. Um, it's It's been enterprise and then some of the colos. Really? Yeah. The colos are talking about those size blocks too? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. But we, we have a node at five megawatts. We have a node at 3.3. 3. 
that's a gas gen set. Um, that's the Yambacher product. I was just in Austria. And then we work on something that's 10 and 18. 10 and 18. Well, and then, and then we have access to gas turbines. If you really, you know, they'll yeah. just be distributed redundant. Like yeah. the UPS model will be, it's just, you'll get, you know, four to make three or nine to make 10 or whatever. You that's know what, what I'm saying? Design. Yeah. So, so, and they're going to, that's probably how you solve for the size of the magnitude. And it makes sense because the building blocks are so big. Now you could scale like that. Yeah. It makes sense. And I've heard a couple of folks, you know, um, in the data center side, come in and talk about like large, you know, H frame turbines and stuff that are like 500 megawatts. And I'm like, you guys want redundancy. You take that thing down. Like, first off, like yeah. turbine uptimes, like our availability is 90%. Like typical gas gen sets are 90, 96, 98%. Yeah. So you get that there, but you take that that H frame turbine now, I'm like, where the hell are you going to find 500 megawatts of power? You know, yeah. like, yeah. I know you're building two gigawatts of data centers, but you know, yeah, you know, so well, that's what I'm saying. The so there's a balance there, right? Between size and redundancy and all that. Yeah. And I mean, that's the truth is I bet you storage is probably uh, the biggest factor if you could figure out a way to. Yeah. But I mean, we're going to put storage all over Texas. Yeah. You know, like... <laughs> yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. Um, well, man, this is pretty incredible. What, what do you see? What what was it that led you to go to PTC? Um, so uh, we have two great folks uh, on our team, Peter Smith and Robin Starcher, um, that have been really working the uh, the data center data, angle. data center angle. They were DCAC. Peter's one who introduced me to you, big tall skinny guy. Yeah, 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 real and, nice guy. Yeah, and uh, we're not related in any f form, but he is a brother from another mother. Um, gotcha. And uh, so they just wanted to get me out there because I've been, um, even though the COO, I do a lot of sales as well, and I've been just you know, helping them out behind the scenes. I was raising capital for the most part last year. So they just want me to, you know, get out there and get in the market. Sure. So, so yeah, so that's why I went and so, uh, I already made my reservations for next year. So <laughs> what did the, what, what, why data centers? Was it part of the target all along from the beginning or were you guys focused more on like, you know, Hey, we're going to go stand up behind a chain of stores that needs to do a cookie cutter replication. We're going to go do an on-demand solution for yeah, them. Yeah. You know, like there's like, we were looking at the, the, you know, the verticals of retail and, um, uh, like manufacturing. And so, uh, we still had them, like we have installations and are talking to customers in there, but just, you know, we're trying to deploy capital where there's a need for power and the need for power right now is in the data center market. Okay. Gotcha. And if you produce a, you know, if you could build a 50 megawatt power plant and that's what we know how to do or a hundred megawatt or 200 megawatt power plants, that's what we got expertise doing. Um, you're going to fit it to the application. And so we just got involved in the data centers because there's not a bigger draw for power right now. And the way that you're getting involved with data centers today is more for standby or for primary? We're getting requests for both. So you're going to start off as the primary solution until the sub, till the utility provider shows up with a substation they could tap into and until then. Yeah. yeah. And when that happens, you become the backup. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, why, so, you know, cause we're seeing RFPs come out there and folks want to roll, you know, gas gen sets out rentals for two or three years. And I'm like that technology and like, let's say you even roll it out as, you know, the prime solution. Now you have a data center that you built that has, you know, standby uh, diesels in it and it's, you're just providing the prime for it and you build it that way, but you're going to add another couple, you know, blocks to that and the utility comes, but at some point use the gas gen sets for backup, you know, for, for a new, a new block that, that you're rolling out. And so I just think instead of going and spending a bunch of money on rentals and they're going to haul them away and it's just like, you know, it's gone. You have an opportunity here to actually get into, you know, equipment into a relationship in an arrangement that benefits you long-term. So it's cheaper and faster. I like it. Yeah. Well, what else am I not covering? I mean, what else do you want to, what do you think is worth unpackaging right here? So, uh, you know, on the R power side, you know, I think, you know, everybody looks at it from, for us, you know, not only do we provide power solutions, like from the physical gen, whether it's backup or prime or, you know, like a utility bridge, but we also are a retail energy provider in Texas. Are you really? Yeah. So, and and we're only doing it to um, certain, um, you know, to certain customers, right? Like we're not going selling retail power to like nail salons and everybody all over. Yeah. You know, but it's like a manufacturing place. Yeah. That's yeah. But but really, where we sell physical gen. So what we can do is we can bring a retail package, you know, to you with the backup gen solution and couple that all together to optimize your utility spend. Really. Yep. Is there a, a specific part of industry that is more likely to find the value in that model? 
um, any large energy consumer, industrial energy like consumer. In the hospital, it doesn't matter. No, any large energy consumer should be, you know, because you're going to get a lower cost of power. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. So I we're do, we're working on one data center right now to do that. Okay. So data centers, is that a big part of your guys' strategy? Yeah. Right now, data centers, data centers and oil and gas. We got a lot of interest in oil and gas. Um, uh, same, same thing, you know. What are some of the predictions that you have on the utilization, the needs of power? Like I've had people, like I said, this podcast series, everything has a targeted focus. And I, I remember talking to you saying, look, I have a nuclear guy coming on here in a little mm -hmm. bit that he represents the product that, you know, they s sell nuclear products that we're going to have other, anybody that's talking about power right now, we're trying to, we're trying to create a platform that allows everyone to understand like, okay, I get it. This not only is a problem that we all understand, but now they understand how it impacts them yep. either personally as consumers or how they're going to perform success in their business. Right. Because if you don't have a project, I mean, if every project is dependent upon power and if you don't have the solution for power, every project's dead. Right. So I try to pay attention to this because it's um, where most of the emerging opportunity is at. Do you agree? Yeah. There's a lot of interesting people flooding into this space. So this is a theme podcast on power and you're a fellow veteran. So I always mm -hmm. love to sit down with fellow veterans, but I really, I mean, I think I, I think you gave them an opportunity to understand what you're all about. Unless you, you have some really badass sea stories, for myself. <laughs> but helping them understand more about our power, because I do want them to walk away mm -hmm. to where operators know, like, this is like, what's the, what's the strike zone. So when I ask you questions, you're like, yeah, anybody, everybody that needs power. I'm like, that's not going to help. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. What's the strike zone? That's like saying like, we can help everybody. Like, all right, well, look, then that's that's gonna be hard for a lot of people to figure out. Like, yeah. hey, man, that's me. But if you have a strike zone that you wanna nail down here and yeah, be like, no. look, the if you are, operate within this realm, we're your golden easy button. Yeah, you know? so I, I think that for in the data centers in particular, we have standby gas solutions that we can provide to you that can replace your legacy diesel solutions that will help you optimize your utility spend uh, and still give you that same resilience that you're used to the five nines, right? And at what scale, what size? At what scale? So we will do everything down to, you know, something small. 500 like, KW, you yeah, said? Yeah, 500 KW right now. Like we we prefer to do five megawatts and above, right? Sure. You know, because um, when you get into interconnect and stuff, that's small scale, it just, it's a lot of work for- And it's 100% yeah. as a service model too, right? Yeah, 100%, yeah. So, um, you know, so like right now, just to- hit it square, we're doing something that's uh, about 15 megawatts M plus one, and then we'll scale, you know, three X that, right? Yeah. Uh, and th and that's easy. And then we are looking at stuff that's in like basically a seven, 75 megawatt blocks. That okay. We're so, yeah. What do you, why did you guys go to those blocks and that topology? Do you, that's the last part I wanted to pick out of you was yep. any specific market trends that you've got access to, um, like Peter Gross was doing his when he talked about like how many gigawatts of infrastructure we have on the US grid today, how mm -hmm. many gigs are mm -hmm. aging and uh, will need to be replaced in the next five years, you well, know? And like, are you, is that the kind of world that you operate in where you're yeah. tracking the needs of power like that? Yeah, well, we look at it. I mean, we, we live in Texas, right? So you're like 44% renewable. Right, right now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Jeff Starcher, um, our CEO, if he was sitting here, he would tell you, you know, he helped write the rules of deregulation for the Texas energy market back in 2001. And he would tell you back then the reserve capacity of the market was at 30%. And people were panicked if a nuke dropped off, you know, at a gigawatt or two gigawatts, right? And now you lose that in wind in like 30 minutes. Sure. <laughs> and our reserve capacity is nowhere near that. So the big trend is that there's a need for power particularly in Texas, um, that that's distributed, that firms renewables. And it's not only happened in Texas. You, you see it happening up in the Northeast and PJM, Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland. You see it happening in the Midwest and MISO. So it's happening across the country. So the, the trend is that these renewables, the biggest trend I see is that these renewables, while good for you know, zero carbon future. They're not a long-term solution. They're, they're creating absolute havoc yeah. and you need gas resources to firm that up. Yep. Well, it's just, uh, our demand for power is greatly outgrowing our ability to produce more clean, renewable sources of power. And uh, the consumer is the demand right now. It's not manufacturing, it's us with all the questions we have. And mm -hmm. and that's why you're seeing this huge suck on the end of the drain, which is data centers, because right now, I mean, our product is sold in power. We don't sell space 
and power and cooling in a way that you may think. It's not like traditional real estate where mm -hmm. people are buying thousands of square feet. They're like, I'll take 10 megs of power or I'll take a yeah. hundred megs of power. And now we're talking about, there's an operator out there that is uh, doing a deal that's one gigawatt, mm -hmm. which has to be the largest of all time. And just a few months before that, there was the other one that broke the record. So like, you know, every quarter, it seems like, and every year right now, we're breaking records year over year and quarter over quarter. So I'm trying to see where, what you're seeing in your patterns and trends and the, and the market information that you get, which made you say like, hey, it's time to focus more, I hear. Yeah, right? no, and, that, and that's- what Was there saying. any big numbers though? Any? Oh yeah, we've seen, I mean, yeah, we've had folks come to us to say, hey, can you help us design two gigawatts? Okay, so yeah. that's what I'm saying. Yeah, and, and, and it's like in the middle of desert and they want to use, you know, uh, gas turbines and there's, you know, like zero humidity and there's, you know, there's no water. Right. And right. like, how, how are you going to develop this out here? Right. And, yeah. uh, and, and so, yeah, we're seeing these just tremendous numbers being thrown up. Um, if you would have asked me two years ago when, you know, our power is coming to fruition, um, we're going to plop down, you know, stuff that's 10 to 50 megawatts, you know, now, you know, I'm bringing on more talent on the team that has large gas turbine experience that's, you know, built the power plants. You know, sure. we, we have some of that, but we've just got so much coming over the rail that we need to get more um, in. And I would say, you know, kind of like a, you know, two to 400 megawatt size. So power is such an, an amazing commodity these days and the value of it just continues to grow, you know, by the day. Um, well, look, is there anything else you want to mention or cover that we haven't uncovered? Uh, I, no, I appreciate this. This is, a, this is a lot of fun. This is, you know, I learned a lot. You started rattling off a bunch of uh, things there. And I oh, thought, really? isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> this industry is fascinating because I get to sit right here. Like, you know, I have to listen to the podcast later after yeah. I've done them with someone. Yeah. Right. And it took me a while to be able to do that because I couldn't stand the sound of my own voice. Mm -hmm. Um, but really I've learned to hopefully not talk as much, but try to get as much out of this, but I get to learn front row, yep. all these people, right? So I've, uh, the, these power ones have brought on some of the biggest powerhouses in this industry mm -hmm. and they're going to be dripping out here, you know, little by little. Mm -hmm. And, and those are the ones that I get to just get blown away yeah. by numbers that they're seeing. Cause you know, everyone operates at their own altitude and airspeed yeah. and I get to kind of sit to where I get to hear what's going on at each one of those bands. Yep. And then you, when you do that, if you could, you know, read the tea leaves well enough, you could kind of analyze and interpret what the holistic bigger picture looks like. And right now what I'm looking at is, um, power is the problem, but the, the only thing lagging power to be more productive and have a greater output is more people. So at the end of the day, I would say, Hey, you know, this all comes down to data centers and at the end it all comes down to power, but at the end it really just comes down to people. So we're all just, we're tr you and I represent the, mm -hmm. the X, the solutions for the existential yeah. threat in the industry. So I just wanted to get um, as many pa power people as I could on this stage or on this podcast to kind of educate the others what what's hanging out there and what's coming. And, and, and hopefully people can listen to what you're talking about. And and there's someone here that finds value and maybe wanting to reach out. In fact, if they wanted to, how can they get you? Yeah. So just, uh, you know, email me or call me, you know, I'm on, I'm, hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, my uh, email address is this Jamie, J-A-M-I-E at rpower1.com. There you and go. Uh, just hit me up. Yeah. Jamie, thank you for being here, by the way. Um, I want to give a shout out to one of my buddies that owns Flags of Valor. But before we did, you have a side gig. I mean, I see your hat and it's a beautiful hat. Thanks. What's the story with this business? So, yeah. So, uh, this, is, this is our family business. Um, it's a Stella Fishing Company based in Clearwater, Florida. We run a uh, uh, two charter boats, a 43 foot and a 42 foot sport fish. Um, it's all, you know, veteran owned and operated. My brother, who's uh, also a former Coast Guard, he runs the day-to-day -day operations. Um, I'm not, uh, it's better when I'm not part of it. My wife and my brother have a pretty, uh, you know. I have that clean, impact clean, on a lot of things, clean, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so clean, clean, clean uh, or operation going. But no, we, we, we fish, uh, we fish the Gulf of Mexico 24-7, 365 when the, when the weather's right. So if you're ever down in Clearwater Beach and you're looking for a charter, you know, we, we're a veteran owned business. So we uh, give a veterans discount and we'd love to have you. And listen, I uh, I asked you to bring it up because as I was telling you, I intend to use it for, uh, you know, we'll take our clients, mm -hmm. you know, hunting or fishing uh, when we want to spend a lot of time with them, appreciation time or time to just grow, develop more stronger relationships. I think your fishing option uh, offers the industry, not just veterans, a really good opportunity to network. So I appreciate it. I want to mention one more thing. If you see this cool flag that's sitting out front, um, my friend, Brian Stortz, 
He's the founder of Flags of Valor. So they're made here in America, made by veterans. And they also contribute a lot back to veteran groups. And uh, he made this one for a bunch of us veterans. We were at a, a summit in Baltimore a few weeks ago and and he showed up and handed these out to all the veterans. So I, I always, uh, whatever I can, you know, push another fellow veterans business. I think it's our duty and yep. responsibility to each other to help sure. each other. So thank you for your, you know, yours, Jamie. And I'm glad that we got a plug of it on this one because I hope the industry uses your, your side pod business here as a resource for us to continue to grow our relationships within the industry. And I know that Brian, who's got an amazing story. So if you've never heard of Flags of Valor, you know, go online, find them on Instagram, find them on Facebook. But Flags of Valor is a veteran owned organization. They do amazing thing for veterans. They build these American products here in the United States. And we're going to have them set up a, a, a booth at DCAC this year to make a badass custom one that they do. So anyways, thank you for being here. Thank, thank you. you for making the trip. And and thank you, Brian. And thank you, everybody at Flags of Valor. If you've never heard of them, go online, get yourself an American flag. They're made by some of the best people in the world. So thank you so much. 